And for those of you who don't know me, my name is Mary Selfox. I'm the Vice Dean Graduate, and I'm very pleased today to represent the Office of the Vice Principal and Dean of the University of Toronto Scarborough. Um, I'm going to be introducing our second speaker in the Great Explorations series. And I just did want to give you a little proviso today. We're incredibly happy that Dr. Kupchik uh, was willing to come in today um, to fill in for a speaker who unfortunately was unavailable today. But he does have a commitment at 11 o'clock. So, I told him um, I'll be a little, the facts are the following. I'll interrupt. <laughs> okay. Point is this. I'm on the banking postdoctoral committee. They have a two-hour training session, cross-country, blah, blah, added from 11 to 1. I said, I will be a little late. <laughs> okay, I'll be a little late. So uh, I will speak, you know, we can finish the Mr. Wonderful introduction, and I will speak for half an hour, 45 minutes, very efficiently. You guys can ask questions, and then I can run away and be a responsible person. Is that good? Well, it's a bigger audience when I get internationally, so this is perfect. I've got to bring you guys with me. Um, I also would just like to remind you to fill out your feedback forms, and in particular, if there are any interesting topics you'd like um, for future talks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm a little hard, I haven't been asked to do one of these yet. So. Anyway. Um, Can I help? Bang. Um, he completed his undergraduate studies in the University of Michigan. I'm not going to tell you when. 1967 December, I was in all the best riots, <laughs> as we all can recall ourselves. It's nice to speak to the same generation, so to speak. You know what I'm saying? Nothing's hidden from among us. And tomorrow's the big day that, you know, many years ago one wondered that would ever happen, but we don't speak about that either. <laughs> You understand the, the humiliation? <laughs> and he did postdoctoral work at the University of Toronto, where he's been a professor of psychology since 1974. He was president of the International Association for Empirical Aesthetics, the American Psychological Association Division on Psychology and the Arts, and the International Society for the Empirical Study of Literature and Media. He received the Rudolf Arnheim Award in 2010 from the APA and the Gustav Feschner Award this past August from the International Association for Empirical Essence. He recently published The Aesthetics of Emotion, Up the Down Staircase of the Mind Body, and I wanted to read that because I had to practice it five times. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Imagine the struggles to write the bloody thing. <laughs> His interests cover design and imagination processes, emotional experience, and social communication. And his talk today is Preserving Ourselves in an Age of Media Addiction. It discusses our insatiable need for information has made us potentially into stimulation addicts. How do we situate ourselves in an age of conspicuous display and preserve a sense of self? So please welcome me and joining. Welcome me and joining. Join me and welcome me. So uh, let me just tell you, I can't put it on the board. I can't even find something to write with. But if you do this, and I have some cards, if you do HTTP, you know, colon, forward slash, forward slash, U of T dot me, forward slash, aesthetics of emotion, one word, you will find nine lectures and interviews with artists and the curator at McMaster. I have the card. I don't have a zillion of them left. I have my beautiful Chinese ones, too, but they're not here. Um, and uh, they'll find nine lectures on emotion and science, etc., and interviews with artists like real people and the curator of McMaster who does what we actually go into the vault of the museum. So if you go to that website, and I'd like to write it down, if there, I, I just can't see a device to do it with, but I have cards here. But I'm just saying, it's, a, it's the longer version of the narrative of today, okay? And you know, more stuff and you can watch it at your own day. Okay, so uh, they asked me to do this and I, you know, I see great explorations, of course, immediately you think of great expectations, which is like grade 10 in high school. Am I missing something here? No, so I like it. the age grade thing is very interesting. And you know, critical news literacy, as, and I'll, I'll have to make a confession there. So I wrote, Preserving Ourselves in an Age of Media Addiction, and I've been invited to lecture in India in January, and I sent along a title like this. I think I scared him with the word addiction. <laughs> so, you know, in Canada, we're a little more, should we say, re receptive to uh, a kind of poetic license. Now, look, um, I'm going to make a confession right away. 
So here's the crisis. I arrived in China to lecture. I have no access to the internet. And I immediately went into Stormy Daniels' withdrawal. <laughs> they, I, and I go upstairs to say, this is my opening line. They say, Jerry, they threw the case out in California this morning. Who knew? Closure. So the point is, we take for granted access to the internet and therefore all forms of news. Then I arrived in China and Google was blocked, so you couldn't get the internet. But I'm sitting with a young woman on the train going from Shanghai to Nanjing who says, you need VPN. So I get a hold of my guys at IT here and my world came back to normal. Mm -hmm. But then when you lose it, you suddenly realize what you've taken for granted. So that was a kind of a, a narrative of reality. Now you realize the addiction and what are the realities of the internet? Now, yeah, I like to tell this to my students, you know, I was, I, I'm from Saint-Jean, Quebec as a child, okay? And at the age of 16, I went to the University of Michigan, grade 11 there, and I, I knew what I was going to do when I was 12, and with the heavenly angels gave me support, I'm able to be here today, and I ain't leaving either, okay? I'm having a good time, and my students are so sweet and wonderful, I can't tell you, okay? Which is the, the real pleasure. And the, the, the bottom line is that when we take a look at the change, I mean, when I was a kid in Michigan, we had a Wang calculator with a little you know, blue screen, and I'd watch it do the square roots. And it went as if there was a homunculus. The deity was inside doing it, because how could it do it so fast? Did we ever imagine a computer? Did we, we had the big computer at Michigan. Did we ever imagine laptops? No, because we'd all be billionaires, right? We'd own it rather than being sitting here or lecturing about it. So we know the change. And the students do not understand the change. They live the change. So in a certain sense, it's very rare that one gets to speak generationally, because we know what was. So what are the implications of the internet? The implications of the internet is everywhere now. I mean, I'm sitting on the plane from Europe, kids sitting next to me, coming from Tanzania, and I figured, wow, well, it's a cultural moment. He was more conversant with popular music than I was. <laughs> See, so then we realize that our, our, our notions of far away are at a certain level an illusion that we romantically preserve in our minds. So in a certain sense, we have a situation of total immersion. In other words, we have a kind of baptism by screen. And then, of course, you know, even in, in uh, Finland, they'll have, or they'll have little uh, signs on the, the road to tell you you can cross the street now because everyone's looking at their screens. And I've got friends who are specialists in the area who deal with media addiction and media ingrainment, and you guys have children and grandchildren who, are, of course, we are pure and not absorbed that way. <laughs> but nonetheless, we know what we're talking about everywhere now. But it has bigger implications, because everything now comes in news blips. I'll confess the periodic CNN addiction, I apologize to you, even my wife is shocked. Okay, and then you realize that they're more like the bobblehead dolls that you see in the back of the car, the dog that's moving, because they're not really saying a lot. It's like People Magazine on television. No offense meant either to the Americas or to ourselves, because I have to confess I was watching it, but not this morning. I was a very big boy. I was, I was very mature for that. Okay? So, this goes hand in hand with the shortened attention span. You see, I mean, you guys see it in people, but I teach it. And like I was a TVO finalist, blah, 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 and they say, coach it, coach it. Wait a sec. You gotta entertain these students. You have to wake up these students. You can't immerse them, inundate them with too much information and demand reflection, heaven forbid. The job is to entertain. So this augmented media comes at a price for the teachers like myself who've been doing it forever. And then for the younger professors who are coming in who have these expectations of entertainment <clears throat> placed upon their shoulders. So where is the critical reflection coming in with all this? That becomes the challenge. For me as a teacher, for you as parents and grandparents, et cetera, et cetera, what do we do? How do we talk to people being critically reflective when they're constantly inundated by a barrage of information which is meant at a certain level to entertain, not necessarily to awaken? See, that's an interesting issue. What my, my best compliment about my teaching was when I was a graduate student, and a kid wrote, when I walk out of Mr. Kupchik's class, my mind feels like throwing up. That's it, huh? <laughs> Come on, huh? Did the boy do something, or did he do something? Then he got his PhD, and it was downhill from there. <clears throat> but the bottom line is this. We have shortened attention spans, okay? It's all different, it's shortened attention spans. The need to be distracted. And news becomes a kind of people magazine. Because, you know, do we remember fighting words? Like when I was a kid, I used to watch fighting words on CBC. Just to hear the vocabulary. Those guys had vocabulary. And styles of discourse and modes of interacting with each other. 
that became the paradigm case for me of what discourse should be like. When I came to the University of Toronto for my postdoc in 72, and Dan Berlin favored a kind of disinterested conversation. We're talking, but the concern is not who's right. The concern is a sense of mutuality and mutual respect. As opposed to the anger and the arrogance that we see and the, 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 the massive division, certainly in America. So we consider, you know, what are you watching? Are you watching CNN? Are you watching MSNBC? Are you watching, you know, PBS, CBC? There's a kind of continuum in a certain sense. And of, of, should we say, different forms of, different styles of discourse. But where is the context? Yeah? Is it a lost battle, the attention span? Can we, can we just accept that? I may have to start crying. Let me do the performance and I'll address the issues afterwards. I, I, want, I, I can't lose my own attention span and flow. <laughs> well, you know, remember, remember folks, one thing is easy. When you do your lecture, it's easy, you're the boss. But when they ask the questions, that's when you really wake up. So let me remain in my stupor and I'll, I'll go through it. But I'll try to remember the question. What was it? <laughs> so the real issue is this. Where is the critical reflection in all this? On the one hand, we want the proper discourse. On the one hand, we want a sense of mutuality. But where is the critical thinking? What is critical thinking these days? With the collapse of time and space and everything is immediately there, how do we learn to stand outside of it all? And the question becomes, and uh, you know, I, I, I do research in a million different areas. I deal with on communication, on people with design. I work with people all around the world. See, that's the pleasure of what I get to do. I work with people all around the world in different domains, and what I do is I come into their world, and I have to hear where they're at, and I come in and say, well, how's about looking at it like this? And it can be very productive and beautiful things come out. But you see, the whole point is perspective taking. And then when we are inundated with media, which is treated as if it were true, they're all true, they're all speaking in a correct way, then, and, and, and the children grow up in that world, how do they learn to stand back? What does it mean to stand back? So it becomes a matter of depth. The most, the most popular paper of all the different kinds of stuff that I've done has to do with the nature of emotion and entertainment. And I make a distinction between two levels of doing it and that applies to all of us. Are we entertained just on the surface? Entertained on the surface like this. My son, who can handle the television much better than his father can, and is now 27, he'll come in, I say, David, I need an action show on Netflix. What kind, Daddy? See, so, and why do I want that? Because I want a minor distraction after a day at the university. I don't want to get into depth. I just want some sort of whodunit. I want to float along the surface. You might have the same thing. A person might feel a certain kind of isolation or, or social need, and they just want to see some sort of light romantic love story. But we're on the surface. It's just sort of you have a need, and you find just the right thing that will modulate that need, and you become synchronized with it. There is not a lot of depth. You're not necessarily carrying it away with you. But the other kind is one of emotional aberration, where there's much greater profundity, much greater meaning where the characters on the stage, the characters in the video, the characters in the program are facing situations that are very meaningful to them and to you. And I'm sure we can all remember going to a play or going seeing a movie where you walked out and you said, wow, that spoke to my life. And you preserve it within you. And you think about it afterwards. And one of the interesting things about being a professor as I am, I have a new course on imagination. It doesn't even exist in North America. And it turns out I've got 60 kids in the class, 70 kids in the class, and they're all into their imaginations. Like it's a very rare case where they actually took the course because they cared, because they had permitted themselves to exercise their imaginations. And in the act of exercising the imagination and talking about it, I yesterday lectured about Plato and Aristotle. I won't be, be banal academic, but Plato distrusted the poets because with their nice sounds, they might arouse the public and they might distract the public but they shouldn't be treated too seriously. Only the philosopher kings are serious. So he was more suspicious of them. And along comes a student, Aristotle, and Aristotle takes all this very seriously. He's the one, the person who introduced this like 300 BC. He introduced the notion of catharsis, which is not just emotion spillage. It's you take a look at what's going on on the stage, and it means something to you, and it permits you to bring your life into it, and in the act of bringing your life into it, not only is emotion released, 
but consciousness can be raised. And this is a reality in the West. The two approaches, and it comes right through, and I've written about this, it's really changed my life to a great extent. You have two traditions in the West that have to do with this issue of surface and depth. Because in the British classical tradition, there's a video of, of a Gilg, John Gielgud going like this and looking like he's in the tragic pose, and everybody says, wow, he's feeling sad. Yeah, he's telling jokes to people off stage. <laughs> he's just faking it. So we are on the surface. There's no real depth. It's a kind of acting where you just say the right word in the right way, and I'll manipulate the audience in the right way. As opposed, and this was very much in the British and French neoclassical tradition, 1700s, 1800s. On the other side, the Germans translated, August Schlegel translated Shakespeare into German in the late 1700s. And why? Because Shakespeare was putting situations on the stage that people could grapple with and see their own lives reflected in it. See? And that seeing your life reflected in it engages you. Are we engaged in the news the same way? Or is it that surface distance? Is it that light entertainment? And what does it take to take new situations and the realities that people face to bring into critical consciousness, to awaken us, so we're listening to them, and in our mind's eye and ear, etc., we're engaging in a real dialogue. Is that the price of the internet? We have the totality of access. The, you have no idea how easy it is for me to do my research now. I just put into keywords and things pop up. We all remember how we used to go to the library and university, and some kid would rip the pages out of the magazine. Have we seen those? Or they all got marked up. Heaven forbid none of us committed that sin, of course. Okay? So we know what it was like. So now we have the total access. We have the total inundation. But do we have the accompanying reflection? Do we have the accompanying emotional elaboration and personal meaning in a world that moves so quickly, that inundates us with the reality every moment of what's going on? Can we slow down? But that's the interesting issue. This is a trade-off. The children face it, the grandchildren face it, but we can remember a time when. And what do I mean when I say we can remember a time when? Well, there's an interesting issue here. Marshall McLuhan, who was a very distinguished professor at the University of Toronto in the 60s, when he said to me, you know, Gerald, I don't know if your research strategy will get you what you want. When it comes out of the word of a minor deity, out of his mouth, it raises existential doubts. But he was very sweet. And what did he say to us? He said the medium is the message and the medium is the massage. What, and you, I, I keep wondering, what would happen if he had a minor resurrection and came back and saw it today? Because what is the meaning of the message? It's not the content now, it's the form. It's everything's fast, everything's immediate. Everything is minor titillation and minor excite, excitement and minor distraction. It's massaging you, but is it massaging us into a stupor? That's the concern. In the late 19th century, I'm going to turn to the matter of privacy. In the late 19th century, Thorsten Veblen, sociologist in Northern Europe, introduced the concept of conspicuous display as a concept to describe the bourgeoisie. So now with the newfound money that comes from the Industrial Revolution, among whatever, you're presenting yourself in a certain way. So conspicuous, of course, it hasn't disappeared. Bless you, it hasn't disappeared where people have a certain car dressed in a certain way, et cetera, et cetera, okay? A commentary. So bottom line is we now have not conspicuous consumption but conspicuous display. I, I'm remote, I, I understand the grandparents have to be involved with Facebook so they can be up to date on the kids and the grandchildren what they're doing. But there are many cases in Facebook and Instagram where kids who are suffering some sense of self-doubt are seeing the lives of people conspicuously displayed and are they real lives? Where is the real self in the midst of the internet? We're talking here about the news. Can we trust the news? But can we trust the self? Can we trust what we are being shown in this new media where everything is immediate and there's a democracy of access? Right? Everybody's got access. Everyone can say anything they want. So we have this movement from conspicuous consumption and I'm dressing a certain way to conspicuous display. I can show myself to anyone having a certain kind of life. Where's the integrity? And the lesson learned, all too late by many, 
where's the privacy? Because once people put it out there, it ain't coming back. And, I, and it cannot hide. It can be found. So my concern here as a professor, my concern as a teacher, is this balance between what, what Reisman called, Theodore Reisman called in the 1950s, the inner direct itself and the outer direct itself. Because when I'm presenting myself on the internet, when I see the world presented to me in a certain way, I'm the outer direct itself because I want to be accepted. And this is a question we can all ask and we have all had to confront. What have we had to do to be accepted in the high school to be accepted in our social group to be accepted in families to be accepted in whatever context? The outer direct itself. But what of the inner direct itself? The person who came from, from Europe or Asia or wherever who had to establish themselves who came with nothing and found a structure in their own lives, who understood what it meant to struggle, who didn't have to present themselves in a certain way because they didn't care. They understood the meaning of values, and that brings us to a fundamental issue. What is the status of social values in the current age? When we present ourselves as caring, and we present ourselves as meaningful, etc., etc., are these just words? When the university has to be polite about the, the native people we took the land away, but it becomes so mechanical, is it sincere? Is something one asks. One must do it politically, but one asks, where is it sincere in the gesture between people? That's the, that's the thing I worry about. Okay? So in a certain sense, I'm going to turn to myself here as an educator. Okay? Like, what do I do? What do I do in the classroom? And I ain't leaving. I'm having a good time. Do I look like a boy losing energy? Not yet. See? So what do I do to wake them up? What do I do to recreate what, what happened with the kid when I was a graduate student? And I, I fill the class, you fill the kid with questions and the kid was one. And this is what you do to bring back the integrity of the theme of the day, which has to do with the nature of news, which has to do with the nature of honesty, which has to do with the nature of meaning. You ready? You know what you do? You wind them up and you let them go be smart. And you know what they do? They go be smart. I'm going to give you two examples. Okay? I have my student, Mary McCarrius. She's from Cairo. She wrote a 97-page paper for me in a course for one-third the grade on the Arab Spring. In Arabic, she interviewed parents whose kid went off to Takriya Square and didn't come back. Well, what are you going to do? The kid was incredible. And they all do it. They get 100-page papers. You know, I wind them up. I torture them a little bit. But they, they love it because it's their paper. No one's making them do it. Okay, good. So I say, she says to me, she made a mistake. I apologize to the people here on behalf of the children. Professor, I'm going to visit my parents in Cairo this summer. <gasps> Mary, you got one week. I want a questionnaire on the topic of resilience because it is a topic of today. It is the recovery of the self. It's the inner direct itself. It's taking a look at the news in a critical way. It's establishing a deeper relationship. Kid makes up the questionnaire. And the way I do it with the kids is this. This is undergraduate, fourth year, okay? I say, look, make up 40 questions and then we're going to have a fight. That's like kind of a joke, but I mean it. Because you've got to protect your favorite questions. So we've got to get it down to 25. So they right away understand what intellectual integrity is. What's important to me? Then the kid takes the questionnaire in English, translated into Arabic. She's on the streets of Cairo. She is arrested on the streets of Cairo. But, see, there has to be a happy ending. Her coach wouldn't tell you about this. Huh? I could be doing time in jail. You mean you're sending off our children and putting them at risk? Where is your integrity? Daddy an industrialist not lacking in funds, appears with her Canadian passport at the police, whatever it is, and bribes the guy not just to get the kid, but to get the data. And the kid is committed to the data. She brings back 50 questionnaires, the sister brings back 50, and the brother-in-law brings back 50 in case something's grabbed at the border. We do science. We ain't losing the data. You can get arrested, sucker, but I want to see the results. Now, point is this. She, the, the findings were beautiful. Because it didn't matter if you were Muslim or Christian. And she was looking at Muslims and Christians in Cairo and the Christian community, Coptic community here. And I share it with you because it's part of the antidote to the situation that we're concerned with. Religion didn't make a difference about resilience. We're predicting your resilience, your ability to come back from trauma. I think we all know what it is. Whether it's in our life or our parents' life or our children's life or the grandchildren's life, we know what resilience is all about. 
We used to call it school of hard knocks in the old days before we all had to be nicey nice to the kiddies. I didn't say that, my son and daughter will sue me. Okay? <laughs> but what's the point here? Her major factor that was predictive of resilience included placing high values on promoting equality and reducing poverty, made stronger by difficult experiences, know how to behave in different situations, have a healthy self-concept, and learn valuable lessons from others. Like, what more do you want? The kid has gone into her community, both there and here, and has come up with a certain sense, a gold standard, of what we consider meaningful ability to handle the situation that becomes the news. Because we can get distracted with the news and the internet and this and that, but ultimately we're dealing with individuals who are making decisions and struggling. And we can see here that they both in Egypt and here in Toronto, the, the Coptic Christians who live here, who've suffered enough in that context, there, it's the strength of the ego, not the religion, that sustains the individual. And the ego and the self is a product of the suffering that you've gone through. What's Kupchik's point? My point is, the more we have struggled, the more we have had to understand the nature of reality, like Aristotle talking about the nature of tragedy and the importance of catharsis, like Schlegel translating Shakespeare, saying, you know what, Shakespeare puts situations on the stage that you and the audience can relate to and learn lessons from and it wakes up your mind and releases your emotions, our kids show it themselves. Wind them up and let them go be smart. Here's another one. So I'm lecturing in China, the Stormy Daniels narrative. I'm lecturing in Shanghai, uh, Be Nanjing and Beijing, the food. I can only tell you. And they understand that Kupchik's a baby. He's not Mr. Traveler. They actually had pictures of me in the seat on the train sending the message that now he's your problem. Okay? <laughs> well, as I said, you never miss an opportunity in what I do, and I am telling you, I am a classic case of old school. I am not real. I say this to my children. I say this to my students. I am not real, because nowadays it's a different kind of story. You're doing one thing, you're doing a lot of it, and don't mess with the bosses. But I don't care. They gave me tenure so long, but who can even remember? And it's too late to take the full professorship away also. So what do you do? You're in China, and you meet someone doing research on moral decision making. Exactly. Okay? And what do you do? You come back. So I've dealt with the Chinese on the topic. It's on the table. It's on the table. And I come back and I have my wonderful Jamaican student, Zach, whom I adore. And he says to me, this is what he wants to do too. So I do the only logical thing. Same thing for him that Mary had to do. I want a questionnaire next week, 30 questions on moral judgments. And send it to the Chinese and say what these guys have to say. And so we get 65 people in China and 165 people at the University of Toronto to complete this questionnaire and tell us what moral decision did you face? And there can be different ones. It can be in, that, in the Chinese context, cheating or, 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 or confronting a beggar on the street who might be faking it, might sue you. We don't think about that one. So different contexts, different realities. But then I get the data. And what do we find? The most important predictor Having to do with moral judgments is what we call in our fancy language self-efficacy. Thinking about it now, did you make the right decision when you were in that moral situation? How pleased were you with the outcome? How much did you think about the other person? How much do you think your decision reflected your true self? So while I put on the tape, we find therefore the same kind of solution in the moral judgments in China and in Canada as we find in resilience in Egypt and in Canada. The importance of the strength of the self, the importance of the learning lessons from others, the importance of learning lessons from one's own mistakes. In other words, the importance of the inner directed mind, not the outer directed display of the self in the internet and Facebook. I did this and I did that, I'm Instagram this, I'm Instagram that, and don't you wish you were living my life? And that brings me to the issue of privacy. Because these are all private decisions these are people are making. These are all private situations that they had to confront, private judgments that they had to engage in. And the strength of the individual that I'm finding around the world, and now we're collecting the same kind of data in Greece, the strength and the solution is the same wherever you go in the world. It's not a matter of being exposed to the news. It's not, so what does critical judgment mean? What does it mean to really reflect? What it means to really reflect means to be centered in yourself, to carry your values, 
And now I tell you something that will make you guys happy. I'm a very, very big believer in ancestral consciousness. They could take my job away for what I just said. <gasps> ancestral consciousness, by which I mean the strength of the students at this campus, whose families come from around the world, lies in their awareness of where they came from and the values of those people. So my ego strength is not just my ego strength. It's my father who was in the Russian Revolution, met Trotsky, went to Lenin, wasn't a big commie, he was just a poor little kid. And the poverty of what came before, and each of you has the same story. In a class of 100, I asked them how far they could trace their families. One girl went back to the Book of Kells. That was impressive. Like, come on, don't mess with that girl. I gave her an A right away. I, I didn't want the ghost of the family chasing me, forget that. But they couldn't go back 100 years. I would just come back from lecturing in Germany, and they went back 400 years. The cab driver went back 400 years. Of course, he owned the company, made it easier. <laughs> What's the point? The strength of the ego, the strength, and not ego, I'm so wonderful, but the strength of the sense of self that makes meaningful judgments in this world, that looks at the news in a critical way, that goes to theater in a critical way, that finds the depth of personal emotional elaboration is the self that is struggling. It is a self that has shown mutuality. It is a self that has shown respect for others. It is a self that has learned from its mistakes and not frightened of its mistakes. Which brings me to the last little piece. Because where is academia today? See, where is academia today? And I, I wrote here, and I, I'm scared to even read it, the corporate structure of the university. The university is now a corporate structure. No offense, man, but thank you for the introduction. I'm sorry I'm losing my, I'm sorry I'm losing my job for saying this. <laughs> but there is heightened formalization in the university system today. Now this heightened form, you have no idea. I, 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 one of my young, could you propose the imagination course? Well, let's have an imagination course. It'll be fun, they'll be brilliant, let's do it. Here's some smart stuff. I had to rewrite it 400 times to make it look like a good boy wrote it. And my young colleagues, they propose courses, they're not necessarily substantive, and this brings the thing to full closure. It's not necessarily the substance of what's being said, it's the form of how it's being said. It's the rules of how it's being said. And the level of professionalization among the new colleagues who are coming in with 20 publications, the level of formalization and expectation of a certain kind of formal discourse is at the same level of efficiency as the internet. But it challenges us to find our own integrity. Because can you tell a kid to go ahead and just go do this study and take the risk? Because are people ready to take risks in the age of the internet? Where we have to have the professionalization, the, pre the, pre the presentation of ourselves in such a way that we, pa we, we pass muster. We are acceptable. The level of fear among the students to make the error, the level of fear among the colleagues narrows the blinders. See? Now, I don't care because I've been doing this so long it doesn't make a difference. But, but, again, building bridges, I can come over from over here to someone who's very narrowly defined and said, how's about looking at it like this? And I have my drooling coefficient concept. Ooh, what a good idea. Let's do that. And you see, I can open my mouth, whatever I want, and be Mr. Q, but I better deliver the data. So the bottom line is the following. In an age of learning to think critically about the news, it ain't just the news. We need to step back. We need to take a bigger perspective on where we are in the way that McLuhan spoke to us that we have to understand the media, its message, the massage, the nature of the formalization, and what's the point? Encourage ourselves, our children and our grandchildren to stand outside and have an honest view of the situation. Not just to be busy, older directed, presenting themselves in a certain way. Look how successful I am, look how rich I am, look how beautiful I am, look how whatever I am. But rather understand the nature of integrity. And that brings me back to the native people. See? 
my daughter's finishing her PhD at, at Western in, in uh, critical thought, and she interviews native elders. Well, little white Jewish girl, first of all, can have difficulty getting into that community because you cannot even be permitted to, to pretend that you care about other communities as a scientist. Forget that. But she is blessed to have the native elders who sit and speak with her, as I have had. It is the wisdom of the generations that came before in our different cultures and here among the native people who have preserved the land and understand that relationship. So what is the antidote to the internet disease? The antidote to the internet disease is the recovery of the self. The antidote of the, to the internet disease is the blessings of our mistakes. The antidote to the internet disease is the awareness of the nature of the internet as a means of democratization, but a means of imprisonment of the self within illusions. Because you get to present yourself a certain way and you can become trapped in it. So what's the answer in the end? First, being honest with oneself. Stepping outside the nature of modernity to feel one's relationship to one's history, one's relationship to the world around. We did a very cute little study on nature, and it had three different factors that came out. Blissed out, chilled out, and freaked out. So blissed out, I'm in nature and I find God. Chilled out, I'm in nature and I feel so relaxed. But freaked out was the most interesting one. I can feel alone in nature, I can feel scared in nature and don't let it get in the way of progress. So we see how deeply people can go in their fears that lead them to be scared of nature, to be scared of thinking, to be scared of relying on the self, to be scared of admitting the errors, to fight back, so to speak, against the formalization of institutions that go against the nature of creativity as such and to take the risk. Just like I took the risk today with you guys. Because you never know how the audience will respond. You never know. But there's a generational similarity. That we have all seen that arc. We've all had fighting words from CBC in the past. And we all have the eternity of channels available today. And we all have the same worry about the kids. Will they get a job? Where are they at? Who are they? And we all have to make the adjustment that our fantasies of childhood, so to speak, that you're only real when you're a professor or you're a doctor or you're a lawyer, etc. We need to make that adjustment as our children have to make for themselves. And the solution in a certain sense is not to be this or to be that, but to confront the nature of integrity itself, which lies in our family histories, which lies in our failures, which lies in our resilience, whether you're in China or Egypt or Toronto. Thank you very much. Questions? Uh, well, I have to go back to the gentleman's question because yeah. I put him aside. I apologize. Go ahead. Remind me. Uh, well, you started with a premise that we have to accept the fact that the attention spans are yeah. uh, gone. <laughs> and I guess I, I was just asking if that's a battle. That's There's a fundamental issue. Uh, when I wrote this book, I tripped into a high-speed digression because I've got to be a good boy and answer everything and run. I wrote a chapter on cave painting in this book. I don't recommend the book, don't buy the book, it's like too scholarly, it's like scary. I spent 25 years writing, 25 years thinking, four years writing, five months editing, and then I wrote it for a crowd that doesn't want to hear. I just got smart. <laughs> <laughs> is that, like, is that a, I just came to lecture to you. She's a moron, get rid of it. It turns out that the, I swear this is the truth, I didn't know. I, you got, I, watch this, we'll see how many of you guys knew this. The brain changed 70,000 years ago. How many of you guys knew that? No, I'm shocked. Because if you're, it's the brain, right? It's the brain. That sounds good. It turns out cave painting happened 40,000 years ago, simultaneously in Europe and in Asia and Sulawesi. Simultaneously. And they had the little oil lamp, the, a, a, a wick in fat, same time. So we're all in the, we're, we're in the cave together. We're watching the flickering going on. And we see some critters on the wall and we paint it, right? That's what happens. They didn't, they didn't know they were painters. They didn't know nothing. 
the brain changed 60,000 years ago. The right hemisphere and the left hemisphere became coordinated through the prefrontal cortex, which is where our executive functioning resides. Tool making did not change for one million years, okay? And the way you make tools is you take a soft stone and a harder stone and you knock out a piece on one side and not on the other, and these two negative areas make an edge. So my little insight was, well, you do that, that's like painting, right? That's what I studied. So you make something dark, it comes forward. So I learned <clears throat> that the changing of the brain between the two hemispheres and the coordination permitted the logical left or the analytical left and the holistic right to come together strategically. So the brain changed 60,000 years ago. Is it changing now? That's the issue. And I don't know the answer because we, we, we take the position, as a good Darwinian worldview, that random changes that occur, and if you survive, that's what sticks. But now there's much more greater sensitivity to epigenetics. And that the way we live now can leave a residue in terms of how the brain works that can be passed on generationally. So the question is, shorter attention span, will it leave a residue? And I, I, I take that kind of question and I ask my students, I say, look guys, if the world is still here 2,000 years from now, 500 years from now, when they can remember, they can look at us, we're so smart as morons, first of all, <laughs> well, humility never hurts, okay? And then when this kind of change occurs and they look back and the brain functions in a different way, will the kind of change you're talking about be one of those ways? That very quickly I can assimilate different information. And then my worry about that potential brain change is just as the two hemispheres become organized, we have the lower part of the brain, which is our animal part of the brain, and the upper part of the brain, which is our human planning side of the brain. Our emotions don't start here. They start in our puppies. They start in our mammalian history. So in a certain sense, as part of my answer to you is, first of all, one would expect that the changing ability to handle information and the speed of it will continue and manifest itself as machines change. My goal here in the lecture and my concern is that we, prefer, we, pre, we maintain the puppy side of ourselves. In other words, the kinds of fundamental feelings that lay at the heart of being mammals. Gestures of caring, gestures of maintenance of others, and that's the battle. While everything shrinks down, we need to preserve our humanity. And our humanity lies not just in remembering our own ancestry, but appreciating our mammalian ancestry as the fundamental uh, saving grace for humanity, because it's the domain within which we show caring, gestures of caring as parents. Reasonable answer. <laughs> yeah, oh, yes, 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 forgive me. I think we've heard that one before. <laughs> wow, she's the only person. Nobody else. <laughs> so the, the, the interesting thing with perfection is the following. It, it relates to what I'm talking about formalization in the university. Because they can send back, well, Coach, your course description is like cute, but it's got to sound like this. So it's form over substance. So the question is, can one have a conversation with the child, more importantly with the parents, to rediscover their own failings and the values that they, remember what, I, what we found in the Egypt data, that your mistakes were your saving grace. I have a friend with a boutique law firm, okay? He deals with billionaires who came off the boat from Italy and wherever in 1930s with zero. They don't care about money. They understand survival. The children, forgive my delicate phrase, and just pissing it away quite nicely because they understand the nature of the struggle. So I would suggest, and I, I do this with my students in their own work, I tell them, look, go and pick whatever topic you want. Find people who've actually lived it. See, and I've, seen, I've, I've published it, I have yeah, the chapter on it. They do gorgeous work. Like Gordon, just not just Mary, but I've had it for 25 years since I started doing this. So the important thing is to rediscover episodes from your own life, in the case of the, ch the, the parents, of their own failings. And the fact that their own failings are what saved them. So it's not the perfection of the child, it's the mistakes of the child. 
Jean Piaget was one of the great psycho developmental psychologists of the century. I saw him when I was in Michigan. He was a little guy with a beret. He was so cute. And my friend was his translator. He be based his career from the early 1900s where he was working with intelligence tests and he discovered the mistakes were more interesting. So our mistakes are our saving grace. And to the extent that we're able to have people go back and visit episodes in their lives in which they made mistakes and in which, from which they learned, to the extent that we can raise consciousness there in the theater of life, then we can say, don't you think that should apply to your child as well? And the idea that the child should not make mistakes goes against how you learn to live your life and put them in that quandary. I, we put it, I, I find that putting people in quandaries where they have to, have to take a look at themselves honestly for a minute because they have to admit that yes, we made mistakes and yes, we learned from them. Well, don't you think that should apply to your children as well? That can show up to perfection. I don't do therapy. I just induce the sanity. It's easy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there was a question. Yeah. Um, you commented about the brain change um, four to five six years ago. Eight six do, do you believe that the brain is changing now in terms of gradual, progressively shutting down its faculties? Because not just because of the internet, but because the shortage of the, uh, the, the shortening of the attention time span, because of the yeah. gradual taking over yeah. of some of the very basic factors of the brain yeah. with technology. Yeah. And, um, so every time something convenient comes into your life, it takes away a bit of it. So my question to you based on your research is, whether this progressive shutdown of the brain, certain part of the brain, is working against our ability to be resilient yeah. and our ability to actually find new, new ground. I'm with you. So we go back to the 19th century. The French uh, philosopher and author Baudelaire introduced the concept of the age of discontinuity. Because he's described in the industrial era in which things are happening faster, faster, faster. And people have more and more roles that they've got to do. I've got to do this, and I've got to do this, and I've got to do this. So people's lives become more segmented. So one might say that when our lives become more segmented, that becomes like a metaphor, we can, we can go both ways. What's happening in the brain is areas in the brain get shut off. We put walls around them. See, so we can put a wall around, well, don't be emotional. You're too emotional, don't be emotional. Or don't be intuitive, be only logical. So one might raise the possibility that there's an ongoing battle, is how I'd like to describe it. As society becomes more complicated, as we have more roles, as we begin to, to feel in inundated, Freud didn't come out of nowhere. The unconscious in his description of repression didn't come out of nowhere. We have certain stresses we've got to turn our back on. So one might say that first, society changes with more roles and more ways to be. It's more challenging because our lives are more complex than they were in the old days, so to speak, when everything was defined and our families were simpler. We were this or that and you didn't ask. As society becomes more developed and everything happens, not just more developed, but happens faster, the question will be, is there a disposition to build walls so that you can live here and then, and then not notice what's going on over there? We have it in our graduate students. Our graduate students in the different areas of psychology do not talk to each other. Because it takes so much time to develop your skills in your fMRI or EEG or this area or that area, you're so narrowly focused that you don't look out of the silo to talk to the person next door. And we all remember in our undergraduate days the incredible pleasures we had having a conversation with a kid who did a completely different thing than we did because it was permissible to have that conversation. So in a certain sense, society is forcing us to shut down. The question whether the brain changed, because the brain will change very slowly. So slowly we don't notice it. But take a look at our lives. Did you predict the internet when you were a kid? We didn't even know it was an option. Or maybe if one of you did, then you, had, then you should have invested early. <laughs> that, that's the way, sucker. <laughs> so the bottom line is, we can talk about brain changing, and that's a certain kind of a curve. I would say that my goal as an educator, your goal as parents and grandparents, is to try to break down the silos and break down the separations so people feel free to look at different parts of themselves and they're not scared to do it because the fear of making mistakes and, and the need to, to cloister yourself in is predicated on fear. 
And we all know this, because I do it with my children. My daughter just turned 30. I've got a son who's 27. We all know it ain't the old day of jobs. It's, not, it's a much different thing, and, and, and you have kids who are, are talented and they're looking for a niche, and it's harder to find. And we have to make that adjustment. So we have multiple adjustments at once. The answer, quite apart from the brain change that will happen very slowly, and I'm certain you're correct. And I'm certain you're correct, but the concern is to break down the silos and permit the people to have their fears, permit them to take the risks, because only when you take the risks do you change, and science changes as well, and the ultimate goal is to build a bridge between science and the humanities. Because we don't want that isolation. I collect my data over here, but I'm not talking to anybody about plays. You want that interface. You want that flow from one domain to the other. It liberates us and moves our society ahead and saves our society. You see, we all live with this illusion. We have this information, information on the internet. Okay, that's good. But are people talking? I was, I was speaking to a, a friend over dinner yesterday two nights ago who's a therapist and saying, you know, kids now, they don't show facial expressions because they just assume they're looking at screens. I never thought of that. So when you're interacting with the screen, you don't have to be, I, I, we're not talking sight, you're just watching the world go by. You ain't showing nothing on your face. So you're not becoming as skilled as an interactor. You're becoming an isolate. So just like we're concerned with the brain changing and areas of the brain, we should be equally concerned about people and society as social isolates. Yeah. We keep talking around the, the uh, um, idea I wanted to throw in, and you brought up Jean Piaget. The very young, I see a problem in wasting some of the best formative years for the convenience of adults and forgetting in what what's sense? good for the kids. In what sense? Do you, in what sense do you mean for the convenience of adults? Well, you need two incomes in a household, so who's going to look after the kids while you're out earning a living to put the roof over their heads? Those are realities, okay? Um, that is a big change we have to confront. So how do you, in the midst of it all, as, as a parent, or I'm, I'm sure it's going to be lean on the grandparents if they're available and willing, but those little guys need some time to just get out at this time of year, say, and walk down a path somewhere and kick some leaves and touch the water and realize that the stream's now cold. One of my friends says to me, he says, Jerry, do you remember the day when you were a kid, when you got on your bike, and mom says, come back before it's dark? Yes. <laughs> I'm telling you, you guys are a very rare audience. <laughs> what happens when we say intimate family moments here? Now, we all have observed something else. Years ago, you go to a restaurant and there were these little kids squawking all over the place. But well, you ain't doing no squawking anymore because they're all stuck in their machines. That's nice because it's more peaceful. But the, <laughs> the issue that you're raising is we are losing a sense of play and the value of play and the meaning of play. In my work on um, imagination, Chinese, Canadian, uh, Germans, the dominant factor was this. Uh, it's so sweet. Uh, when I was a kid, I liked to, to, to have imaginary friends. As an adult, I do different role play, I have colorful dreams. It was a dominant thing about imagination, not practical planning for the future, et cetera, et cetera. And the question is, are we permitting and encouraging that kind of behavior? A girl comes to my office this fall. The professor cook said, I want to do a feast with you. I said, fine. I said, what's your topic? Dolls. Now, D-O-L-L-S. You guys with me? Dolls. So Kupchuk hears dolls. If I were younger, it ain't going to help my career, kid. It's over. <laughs> I now consider, you know, I got these wonderful Mr. Wonderful Awards. I am now in my post-ambition phase. <laughs> Isn't that a nice place to be? A post-ambition phase. You're just free. Michael will have to edit that out of this thing. <laughs> but the, the point is this. She changed my life. These are serious people. Doll makers and doll collectors and ball jointed dolls. I had to, none of you have to confess this, but I confess I pulled the arm off my teddy bear when I was a kid. <laughs> I relived the guilt and the presence. <laughs> it was an ugly moment in my life. But the point is, because I permitted her to play, because I permitted her to go interview adult doll makers and doll collectors, because I permitted her to do this and to go in all the different ways that one can take dolls as a serious event and from around the world, 
every time I get together with this girl, we make up more and more and more incredible kinds of research that will go in my next book on imagination. Not that she has to do it for me. So the bottom line is, are we enablers or restrictors? And the reality is that, you know, I have friends in Germany, I lecture there with frequency, you know, the thought that a woman would go to work? <gasps> Impossible. Yeah, 30 years ago. Now if you don't go to work, you don't have a place to live. So these are the realities. So we have the structural change in the world. We have the informational rate change in our world. Can we struggle as grandparents and parents, as individuals, to preserve what we consider common values as in play? Where play doesn't just mean the kid can go out and play and ride the bike, etc., etc., which of course is important, but it translates through the years as taking risks, finding new ways to make an income, See? being out there in the world and not being frightened and realizing you have all these different opportunities. So play in children translates into play as adults, translates into not being scared of one's own mistakes, translates into freedom and placement. And the, the psychologist Eric Erickson talks about the stage, eight stages in life. He was a part of a post-Freudian. And something we all struggle with and we all face and we confront as do our friends in the later stages of life, ego integrity versus despair. And ego integrity for us has to do with our struggles and our enabling of others to have lives and relationships and to move the restrictions that we have on children and to be open to possibilities and to take the risk, which is a superordinate theme, because that's play. And taking the risk for a woman to go into the workplace was a risk. They're all to the bottom line, not to be frightened of risk, but to have faith in the value of error and to you know, and to have faith in the value of intuition, where intuition means your gut experience built up over the years that begins to shape your judgment, not just erroneously, but potentially leading you to places unexpected. And I'd like to finish off now. <laughs> <laughs> I know I got to shh. Ottawa can wait. All right, so one more question. Well, and then he has to go be responsible I, for I, it. So. What, what do you see as the role of humility and appreciation? Of wisdom oh, in our society. What a setup. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just saying because it seems to me in this age of the internet, everybody thinks that they're an expert. And yeah. so there's so little people that have a humbleness <laughs> that my opinion is this. And what about we don't look to experts for wisdom? And I'm not saying experts are always right, but you, you for example, have all these things. I am perfect. I tell my kids. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've got to get together over here for a therapy session after. I mean, I'll always be right, but I'm never wrong. <laughs> I, I married a doctor. You're a nurse for the rest of your life. I know what that means. So here's the answer. Okay, this is perfect. I, I decided to do what I'm doing when I was 12 years old for whatever reason. Okay? I, I was lucky enough to do my PhD quickly and get the job and survive all academia and be able to do this. So I have the following little advice before I run off to be a professional, so to speak. There are two pillars, sweetness and grace. See, because I'm a lucky boy, I've got a 91-year-old mentor. I'm 70, I'll be 71 soon, God help me. I've got a 91-year-old mentor. He swims four times a week, that's what he mentors me about. Come check, get in the pool, it'll keep you alive. <laughs> the most foremost historian of psychology in the world. I get to have lunch with this guy every few months and we go to places that are just incredible. So he shows grace. There are people uh, above me, so to speak, borders of Canada, this or that, with whom I have ongoing lunches who show grace. Or someone randomly in the street you might meet who shows grace, which means a gesture of wise caring. See? And it is our responsibility as people who have lived, it is our responsibility of people who have survived to be here today to show grace to others, whether it's in the native community, whether it's to our children, whether it's to random people in the street. By that I mean a gesture of caring and uplifting, but they have responsibility. Because I have an incredible amount of sweetness for my students. The scummy ones stay away from me. The kids were the great grubbers because I'm very nice. Just don't piss me off. <laughs> See, then everybody knows the rules. So sweetness and grace, because the students come to you in an honest way. 
They are permitted to bring their families with them. They are permitted to bring their fears with them. They are permitted to take risk. As a consequence, they can be sweet because I've affirmed their legitimacy to play. I've shown respect for the need to, to uh, um, not worry about being perfect, to understand the nature of the fact that, yes, we have so many distractions. So the balancing of sweetness and grace is a foundation of humility. Because humility, as my mother said when I was a kid, and she was 50 at 48 almost when I was born, a fool loves his own thoughts. I've been living it my whole life. <laughs> okay, but I got tenure, okay, and I got full respect. It, it can work, it can work. But, but the, the point I'm making is that we need to feel a certain, to bring it all to end and then run off and be a good boy. Yeah, where were you? Okay, the goal that we have is humility in the sense that aren't we lucky in all the ways that we live in Canada? that we have survived, that we have parented, that we have grandparented, that we have done all these things. Aren't we so lucky to appreciate that? And that is the foundation of humility. And the further foundation of humility is the realization that it's not just me. I stand on the shoulders of generations. We stand on the shoulders of generations who suffered. They didn't come here to Canada because they were loaded. They came mostly for a new opportunity, whether it's the famine here or whatever realities. And so to the extent that we go beyond the narrow confines of our own egos, then we open ourselves up to an awareness of other, an awareness of others a foundation of humility that permits us to support the two pillars of sweetness and grace. And now we'll run off and be a good boy. <laughs> Thank you so much for your great